As geologists and paleontologists, we are constantly trying to learn as much about the past as we can in order to create a complete record of Earth's history. One way that we do this is by a process called correlation. Correlation basically means matching. Suppose that you were at location A in this picture. If you were to drill down, you would drill through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers of rock. In location C, if you were to drill down, you would go through one, two, three, four, five, six layers. Because we know that in certain parts of the Earth, we have different layers of rock. And that could be caused by weathering and erosion, which got rid of rocks. It could be that certain areas were underwater at different times, and so different rock layers formed at different times. There's basically no place on Earth that has a complete series of rock strata. So what we need to do is we need to be able to correlate layers from one location with layers that formed at the same time in a different location. And by doing this, it gives us a more complete picture of Earth's past. So there are a few different methods that we can use to correlate rocks, a few different techniques. The first one, is looking for similar rock characteristics. So what you would do is you would go to two different locations. So let's say that letter A is in New York and letter B maybe is in England. And we'd walk around and we'd look for outcrops of rock. We'd look for big stacks of rock that are visible. And we would try to match them based on things that they have in common. So for example, um, in these two pictures, I'm noticing that there are two layers of limestone. So perhaps I can correlate those uh, because I also noticed that there's two more layers of the same color. And we know that if a layer is on top, it's generally younger. And if it's lower down, it's generally older. Uh, we could correlate this gray shale with this gray shale because they are both found underneath limestone this sandstone and this sandstone, they correlate, they match. Now you'll notice that not every layer matches, and that's what makes this technique challenging. If you like puzzles, you're probably really going to like rock correlation. Okay, so this is the simplest method of correlating. You basically walk around looking for outcrops, and you try to match rocks based on their characteristics. Another technique that we use would involve what you're seeing in these two pictures. So let's say we want to try to correlate these rocks. This one is a little trickier because I'm noticing many of the same layers. I see limestone and limestone, and I see limestone and limestone. I'm not quite sure which ones correlate. I might think that the two bottom ones go together and the two top ones go together but they actually don't. And here's how we can tell that. There's a layer of volcanic ash over here, and there's a layer of ash over here. When volcanoes erupt, the ash often will spread around the world and it falls quickly. And so ash is an excellent way to correlate or to match layers of rock. Chances are that this ash and this ash formed at the same time, which means these two layers of limestone correlate. And it probably means that these siltstone layers correlate. This limestone either never formed here or it was weathered and eroded away. Okay, but for now, I want you to realize that using volcanic ash is an excellent way to correlate layers because the ash travels over a wide area and then settles down fairly quickly. So ash is excellent for correlating. A third technique that we use very similar to the ash. You'll notice that in both of these pictures, there is a white layer followed by a much darker layer on top. That white layer came from the meteor that caused the dinosaurs to become extinct. When meteors or asteroids hit the earth, the debris that's broken up, just like ash, will cover large parts of the earth's surface. These white layers are the layer of iridium that was discovered all over the earth and it is the same age as when the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. 
So looking at meteorite or asteroid deposits can help us to correlate or match layers. Perhaps one of the best methods of correlating layers is to use what are called index fossils. We know that when organisms die, their, their, their bones and their bodies often become fossilized if they have hard parts and if they're deposited and buried quickly. But not every fossil is an index fossil. To be an index fossil, there are two requirements that have to be true. Number one, the creature had to live over a wide geographic area. So it had to live in many places because if it only lived in one place, you're not going to be able to match the fossil to any others. The other requirement is it had to live for only a short amount of time. When we say a short amount of time, we mean geologically speaking, right? The earth is very, very old. The earth is 4.6 billion years old. When we say that a creature had to live for a short amount of time, a short amount of time could still be a hundred million years. Geologically speaking, that is a short amount of time. So it gets a little bit tricky when we're dealing with geologic time versus what we think about when we speak about time. When you look at your reference table and you look at your time scale, all of these fossils on the bottom, these are all index fossils that have been found in New York State. So we know that they were widespread and they lived for a short amount of time, geologically speaking. So let's take a look at how we might do this. Okay, so I have three outcrops. I have three columns of rock. These were found in three different areas and we're able to see some of the layers. So what we would do is we would look for index fossils that are in all of the layers. In this case, we see a trilobite in outcrop one, in outcrop two, and in outcrop three. We know that this trilobite, if we look at our time scale, uh, that trilobite was letter A, elliptocephala, and the elliptocephala lived in the Cambrian period. It's an index fossil. So if I find that fossil in these three layers, I know that these three layers formed in the Cambrian period. So I'm able to use this method to match the layers. Okay, so let's see how well you understand this. To be an index fossil, there are two requirements. The creature had to live over a wide area and it had to live for a geologically short amount of time. In this diagram, we are looking at four different outcrops from four different locations and there are numerous fossils. Let's see if we could figure out which fossil would be the only one that we could call an index fossil. Okay, so let's start with this one over here. Does this meet the requirements of being an index fossil? Well, is it widespread? The only place I see it is in outcrop four. I don't see it in three or two or one. So it is not widespread. I have nothing to match it to. So not an index fossil. How about this trilobite creature? So is it widespread? Well, I do see it in outcrop four and I see it in three and two and one. So it is widespread, but did it live for a short amount of time? Well, the answer is no, because I see it appearing in multiple layers. If it's found in multiple layers that are separated by a layer in between, then it's not a short amount of time. In other words, I don't know, does this one match with this or with this? I can't tell. So it is not an index fossil. The same thing is true about the shell over here. It is widespread. I see it in all four columns, but in outcrop two, I see it in four different layers. So it lived for a very long time. So it is not an index fossil. So the one that we're left with is this swirly sort of shell. It's found in all, in all the outcrops, so it's widespread, and it only appears one time in each outcrop. Okay, same activity here. If you look at those fossils, see if you can determine which one is the index fossil. Pause the video and then start it again when you figure it out. Okay, so the answer is again, it's the swirly shell. It is found in all the outcrops, 
and it only appears one time. Okay, so let's practice correlating rocks. When you're given different outcrops, the first thing you want to do is you want to find a layer of rock or a fossil that's in as many outcrops as possible. If you can find one that's in all of them, you're golden. In this case, if we look at all the names of the rocks, we'll notice that there is conglomerate in each of the layers. So the conglomerate is what we're going to start with. So I now know that this conglomerate would correlate with that one and it would correlate with that one. So those conglomerates are the same age. Now anything above them is going to be younger. Anything below them will be older. So there's nothing younger in this column over here. So I'm going to ignore this one for now. Let's focus on these two. In both of them, I see a layer of shale, and then I see siltstone, and then I see red sandstone and fossiliferous limestone. And then I see in the middle column, I see sandstone and glacial deposits. That tells me that out of all the rocks we're looking at, the glacial deposits are the absolute youngest. They would be farthest at the top when we correlate these. Now let's work down the column. Let's go underneath that conglomerate. So there's nothing below column B, so we ignore that. But I see black shale here and I see black shell here, and then I see limestone, and I see limestone. I see shell containing trilobites and shell containing trilobites, which leaves us with this gray sandstone. The gray sandstone, therefore, has to be the very oldest layer that we're looking at. Okay, let's do one more together. So we have four different outcrops here, location A, B, C, and D. And what we want to do is we want to list the layers in order from youngest to oldest. So again, we're going to start by finding the number that appears in most of the columns. So what number do you see in all the columns? Okay, hopefully you notice that there's a seven in each column. So I'm going to line these up so that all the sevens are near each other. Now, unfortunately, you can't do this when you have a piece of paper, but you could draw lines like I did on the last one. So these sevens all correlate. They're all the same age. So I see rocks that are younger than the seven, and I see rocks that are older. So the seven is going to be somewhere towards the middle. So let's put a seven over there. So let's do the younger ones. What do we see on top of the seven? Well, over here and over here, I see a one. So the one, because it's on top, the one is going to be younger. So we'll list that one on top. The only other rocks that are younger than the one are what we see in location B. I see a four and I see a six. So the four would have been younger than the one. And the six is the absolute youngest layer that we see here. Now let's work our way down. Let's find the oldest rocks. So I notice in these two columns, with the seven, there is a nine. And since they're together, it means the seven and the nine are the same age. So we put them next to each other. Okay, now let's go down to the lower ones, the older rocks. Underneath all the sevens, I do see a two. So a two would be older than the seven. Underneath the two, well, in two of the columns, here and here, I see a 10. Over here, there's an unconformity. So something's missing from there, and it must be the 10. So I now know that the 10 is older than the two. Let's keep going down. Underneath this 10, there's an unconformity. So something's missing there. But underneath this 10, there's no unconformity. So I now know that the 3 came right before the 10. The 3 is older than the 10. And so now we have the missing piece that will connect this 3 and this 3. And supposedly, the 3 is what we're missing at this unconformity. So now I see that underneath the 3, I have my 5 and I have my